Hey there, Ride the Car Guy here, and by the end of this video, 8-Ball is gonna be running. Not driving, running. This video is part of a long series. This is video number 12, so if you wanna catch up on the other 11, check out the upper right-hand corner of your screen where you're gonna see a playlist. In the last video, I made a list, just an old-fashioned cardboard and Sharpie list, to try to make sure that I don't forget anything before we try to start up the 8-Ball. I did knock a few things off that list off camera. So for instance, I did tighten up the, what we have of the exhaust right now. So basically I wanted to get the O2 sensors in there and I wanted to get the second cat attached in case we want to start it without the rest of the exhaust on. I also threw on the front bumper. That's just four bolts and you know, tighten them down. Nothing really special about that. I was just really excited to get off the floor so I could stop tripping on it. And since I figured out I was just being an idiot and putting the tie rod ends in upside down, I uh, assembled the front suspension again. So I put the tie rod ends in, tightened those down to spec, and of course um, did the upper ball joints, put those to spec. And then um, all I have to do is throw the tires back on and torque down the axle nuts. But you have all those specs, just go ahead and knock that out and then we'll, we'll move forward. The next thing I wanna tackle is fluids. And to do that, we need to put the power steering pressure sensor in. Uh, if you didn't buy a new uh, pressure line from the pump down to the rack, then you probably already have your sensor in, so you don't have to worry about that. But I didn't, I bought a new one, so I gotta put that in. Then once we do that, we can start filling up fluids. I'm gonna just you know, basically pour in power steering fluid, nothing special there. But when we get to the coolant, we have to do a vacuum fill, and we'll talk about that. So let's get started. All right, so down here, you're gonna see the hole in which this needs to go. I just have my old uh, power steering pressure sensor, but I did throw a new O-ring on it. And then we just wanna feed this in. There we go. We can see how, just how insanely close it is to the power steering pump pulley. Now this is a 27 millimeter socket, but as you can see, there's absolutely no way I'm gonna get that on there. So I think what I'm gonna do is find a, uh, maybe an adjustable or something and just kind of tighten it down as much as I can and just kind of hope for the best. I'll check once it starts running if it's leaking or not. All right, I gotta say, that is not instilling a lot of confidence in me. But I guess we'll just have to kind of find out how it goes. Now up here is the cable. So let's try to feed it down here. Hope that it can actually fit on here. And then I guess it flips around this way. Oh my God. <laughs> Okie dokie, that is way too tight. I may have to extend that. Well, it's technically installed, but man, is it not the way it should be. If you recall, I bought the wrong hose for, um, to go from the pump down to the rack, and uh, it really should be in a different position altogether. But it is there. It's technically not, it's not like the wires are taut or anything, and nothing should be moving, right? So it's not like the fuel injector is moving or the power steering pump is moving. So it's not like it's going to be putting any additional stress on that wire. I'm going to run it, see what happens. Hopefully it all goes well. And then... Um, and then all I'm gonna do is just literally take power steering fluid and pour it in. Once you're starting it and running it, have more power steering fluid available. And obviously once you start turning and moving everything around, it's gonna start pulling more power steering fluid out of the reservoir and uh, you know filling up any, any space that needs to be filled up. Cause the whole cooler is empty for instance, right? There's that whole circuit there that needs to get filled. I'm just gonna fill it up to the hot max and it will for sure bring itself down to cold max or cold minimum. And I'll, you know, probably far beyond that and I'll have to keep filling it. For this one I'm just using, it's literally called Nissan Power Steering Fluid. That's it, so we'll fill it up and then we'll move on. All right, we're at our hot max, actually a little bit above it. So we'll let that sit and that's just gonna be something we're gonna have to deal with once we get the engine running. All right, next up, let's talk coolant and we are going to be vacuum filling the coolant here. Why is vacuum filling important? Well, in a lot of cases when you fully drain a system of coolant, uh, when you go to fill it back up, there's little air pockets in the system. A lot of times people will just burp the system, you know, like open up your radiator and kind of squeeze your radiator hoses, massage it, all of that jazz, but that may not get all of the air out. An easy way to mitigate that issue is to create a vacuum inside your coolant system and then fill the coolant using the vacuum. Basically let the system suck the coolant in. So we're gonna start by taking the reservoir tank cap off and I'm gonna go grab my vacuum system. I bought this one, it's called the Vacuum Purge Coolant Refill tool set that really rolls off the tongue. These are, I think this was under $60 on Amazon, but I'll of course put a link down in the description below if you wanna buy this specific kit. This kit's gonna come with a few things. Obviously you have your little vacuum adapter. This is gonna go into the coolant reservoir tank. And then you have some adapters for different sizes. If yours is bigger, ours actually slips right in, which is super cool. Then you have a little T connector to run vacuum. And of course to suck up the radiator fluid, which you have a hose for. But before we do that, on this particular reservoir, I have a, like a, emergency sort of release, if you will. So in the cap, if there's too much pressure, this will push up 
and then it will push fluid out of this. Unfortunately, this connection doesn't go down far enough to actually block this off. So we have to block this guy off and then we can start using this. For me, I'm just gonna quickly take the mounts off so we can move this freely. I don't wanna fight with this connection that's kind of pointing directly into the fender here. All right, so we can move this around. There we go, get a little bit of extra space there. And I happen to have this guy lying around. This is like a termination. Hose goes in one side and goes nowhere. This was off of one of the heater core connections. So I'm gonna slide this on, tighten it down, and that should seal that up for us. All right, that should do it. So I grabbed my coolant and I have it ready. This particular one is not diluted, so I had to dilute it 50-50, but just check your container. Sometimes they're diluted, sometimes they're not. So I have that ready for me, and I'm just gonna pop that, just have it loose. Let's grab our little connector here, make sure this is clean. Should be, it's brand new. And then just turn this till it's tight in there. It's pretty good. You'll know right away, you'll be able to hear it if it has a leak, so. Grab the T connector. We wanna hook that in right there. There we go. So grab your airline from your compressor. And as soon as you plug this in, it's just gonna go because it basically just has a straight line through. And when you open this, it's gonna create a vacuum from the air passing by it. And what we're looking for in this particular dial is in centimeter mercury. So we wanna see between negative 50 and negative 70 centimeter mercury. So this is in the off position. I'm just gonna turn it on for now or open if you will. So that means as soon as I plug this in, this is gonna start building vacuum inside the system. And then once I'm happy and I see it between 50 and 70, I'm just gonna shut this valve off and disconnect. All right, I got to about 55. And what's cool is you'll see all of your radiator hoses will actually collapse under the vacuum. And it looks like our pressure is holding, which is obviously a very good sign, right? That means that we don't have any leaks in the system. And our little temporary guy here is doing a good job. If you get your ear real close, you can hear if it's uh, leaking from this connection as well. So if you do see that the pressure's dropping either slowly or quickly, just get your ear down because it could just be right here. I wouldn't panic right away. So now we want to disconnect this, grab our fill line. There we go and drop this side into our antifreeze. You wanna make sure it gets all the way down to the bottom because you don't wanna be sucking air in. And then once you release this, it's gonna start pulling antifreeze into the system like this. There you go. Now it's pulling it really quickly. So if you need to pause for any reason, you can just pull this, you know, turn this off. But we're gonna keep on going. You can actually hear it running through the system and hear it running into the hoses. Just keeping an eye on it, making sure we're good. All right, we're getting real close to the nozzle. So I'm gonna go swap this out with a new one. You wanna be real careful with this. This still has vacuum in it, but you wanna very gently set it there. Make sure there's not sucking air up in there. There we go, I'll be right back. All right, I have it replaced. Make sure again it's at the bottom and then go. We effectively just wanna go until our hoses fill back up and we're out of pressure. And we're nearly out of pressure there. And it went through a whole other gallon too, wow. All right, we're out of pressure, let's shut it off. Okay, so as a side note, uh, I wasn't paying attention and I completely filled up the reservoir tank. So uh, now I'm gonna have to go in, I'll just, I have a baster and I'll just go in and grab it out of here. But um, I seriously, I don't know if you can see that, it's filled up to this. So, I mean, clearly it's working. Everything should be there and filled up, very filled up. So I'm gonna go uh, pull that out and get it back down to the max level. Disconnecting, it's easy. Just want, make sure this is off and then disconnect this. And then I'm just gonna lift it up and it should drain it back in. All right, and then when you pull this off, opens it back up. Pack everything back up, get this secured back on, and make sure you do not leave this on. This must come off. That is a pressure relief for emergency situations, and uh, you really don't want that plugged. So make sure that's pulled off, and then you're done. For me, I'm gonna re-secure my tank to its original location, but you shouldn't have to do that. So as part of this process, when I was reading through all the forums and whatnot, um, everybody talked about cooling and everyone said that burping is just not enough for these engines when you have them disassembled and everything's drained out. Uh, just a standard fill and burp isn't going to do it for you. So um, for the 50 bucks or whatever it was, 50, 60 bucks, it's definitely worth the peace of mind for me. And uh, again, if you want one down in the description below, but, um, but that's sorted. I feel good about it. The hoses are nice and plump again. Everything's, I mean, if you squish them, you could hear water moving around. So it seems to have gotten everywhere, which is awesome. And, uh, and that's it. I'm gonna go fix this off camera and then we can go move on. Okie dokie, here's the list I have going. Um, 
things we need to connect and fluids we need to fill. We just did the antifreeze, so we're good on that. The transfer case, I think we're actually gonna do that next. Rear diff is just maintenance. I'm probably not gonna do that until afterward, but um, down here we did the power steering pressure sensor. Ah, oh, grease tie rods, we can do that. Put in the battery. All this is gonna be after the AC low line, which is still in the mail a week and a half after buying it. Um, exhaust, we have to build a custom one, and the entire front end, that's, uh, that's gonna be at the very end because we're gonna actually test it and run it before we reconnect everything. All right, transfer case, let's do it. For our transfer case, we're using Nissan Matic D. So Nissan Matic D for the transfer and Nissan Matic J for the actual transmission. Bought a cheap little manual fluid transfer pump. So just grab it, throw it in there. And I think, is there a double? It's a double cap on here, nice. So there we go. And so now we're just gonna have to go under there, throw this line in, pump it until it spills out. It's fill to spill. All right, now that that's done, um, you can really just do, it's the exact same process for the front final drive or the front differential. Um, you just use APL GL5 80W90, same concept, fill it up until it starts to spill out or you can feel it with your finger when you put your finger in there and then that's it. I am gonna put a little bit of transmission fluid in because we did spill a lot pulling out the engine. So, and we emptied the cooler. We'll put a little bit in there, but for the transmission on these, you're supposed to you know, have them running and check it while it's running and fill it while it's running, all that jazz. But we'll put a little bit in just so we're not too low when we first start it. All I'm really gonna do here is make sure that it's touching the cold range on the dipstick. So take off our retaining bolt here, grab a clean towel, yank this super long thing out, wipe it down. And then of course, just go ahead and check your level there. Okay, it says I have a metric ton of it, cool. So I guess in that case, since the dipstick isn't gonna do its job right now, probably because we had things moved around and had, had the transmission tilted and moved around all that jazz. So what we'll probably do then is just wait on this until, uh, until it's actually running and you can you know run through all your gears, get the transmission cooler filled back up and then we'll check this. I'm just gonna throw this back in so I don't misplace it. All right, onward. All right, I'm gonna make a new category here. It's gonna be uh, called check after running. Check after run. And that's gonna be PS fluid and trans fluid. Cool, so we did our initial fills, diff, transfer case, cool. And now we have these two to check once we are running. Trans cooler's connected, forgot to mark that. Well, awesome. I'm actually gonna pause for now because the AC low line, I wanna have the air inbox and intake off uh, to do the AC low line. It's just gonna give me a little more access. And obviously the math comes along with the air intake and the air box. Battery doesn't make sense right now. And exhaust, I'm gonna do tomorrow when all of my protective equipment comes in, so. Let's take a break and uh, we'll catch up tomorrow. All right, it's the next day and this is gonna end up being one of those videos where I end up shooting a little piece of it each day for like four days because this is the part of the job where you do one little step and then you hit a roadblock and then another step and then a roadblock. Uh, it's pretty irritating. Speaking of pretty irritating, uh, something that is severely irritating is this AC low line. So I did technically get a part today that was supposed to come in. It just wasn't the correct part. So long story short, I ordered one based on the suggestion of someone who did a VK swap write up. It was the wrong one. It was the exact one I already had. That took a week to get here. So I didn't realize that until a week later. So I ordered another one from Texas and that took eight days to get here, and that wasn't even an AC line at all, it was a power steering line. And here we are, two days from when I'm supposed to finish the video, and I cannot, for the life of me, find that uh, line. I have one on order from Nissan, but now they're saying another five to eight days. So I got desperate, I went around, I looked at, uh, I looked for stuff online to like repair AC lines, I was gonna like take two and connect them together. Um, I went to Napa, because apparently they can fix AC lines, apparently they can't fix Nissan AC lines, whatever but I do have one more trick up my sleeve. And that's this bad lad. This is the line that runs in the back of the engine bay from the Titan. So my theory is, instead of replacing the line that goes from the AC condenser to this port, just replace this line, because this is a hell of a lot longer than the one in the Xterra. The whole basis of this is that this line in the Xterra starts about here, you'll see it right here in a minute, and the line can't reach it, right? That's, that's basically the whole problem. So theoretically, if we can get this to install in the Xterra engine bay, then we will have solved our problem. So let's try it. I'm gonna go ahead and install this line that's 
technically too short, but it's the one that I bought new and it just needs to go in the side of the AC compressor. So I'm gonna install that side first so we know how far of a gap we need the bridge. All right, this is uh, gonna be tough to see, so I'm sorry in advance. All right, if we feed this down here, this needs to go in that little bad lad. There we go. And the O-ring is pretty chunky on this. So we wanna be a little careful when doing it because if you pinch it, you're just gonna, you obviously won't create a seal, right? So like that, it'll pop in real easily, but it'll uh, pinch the damn O-ring when it does it. Oh, oh, I think I got it. Ah, I think that's it. I'll look all the way around it if I can, make sure it's not pinched and then get the bolt in there. All right, so here's our issue. Here's the new pipe or hose coming out of the AC. Here is uh, the existing line. And as you can see, it don't reach. And even if it did, this is uh, 90 degrees off, right? So this is, would connect like that and it's not there. So let's get this brake line that's also not gonna work out of the way here. So my thought is grab this. This is the one out of the Titan, connect it in somewhere you know around here we'll see like that and that's going to have more than enough distance let's just hope that it works to do that we need to disconnect it from the left side there's a couple 10 millimeters right here to take off the support on the right and then over here it should just pull right out of the firewall i know this is sort of a really tight spot to see in but there is one 10 millimeter bolt that holds on well this right here this little bracket here. One line goes up to the condenser up front and then one line comes up and obviously goes to the other side of the engine bay. So I'm just gonna slide this in here, loosen this, make sure I drop the bolt. Oh wow, I didn't. Oh. And then swing this to the side because we don't need to pull off the bottom hose, that small one or pipe, and then just give this a little wiggle. There we go, comes right out. With that side off, we just take the supports off of the right or I guess left side technically, left engine bay. The pipe should come right out. All right. Oh, we should probably be gentle over there. These things are fragile and annoying, kind of like me. All right, perfect. Let's grab our Titan pipe here, swing it down over these, and oh, it looks like it's gonna fit, please. Just push it in. Oh my gosh, it's in. And it, the bracket fits just fine. Oh, wow. All right, secure both sides. I'm just gonna put the screw back in here. There it is. Oh man, I think this is gonna work. All right, we have the hose here now and it looks like, yes, I can reuse this. So there's a hole in here that we can reuse to support. Honestly, for now, I'm just gonna grab a big washer and use that existing screw and just throw it in there and just cinch it down. Oh yes, that's great. And then this bracket we're not gonna use. So let's pull that off. And look at that, even this little guy is gonna slide our uh, booster line and support it there. Now this one should connect. Let's take a look. Oh my gosh, it does. <sighs> Unbelievable. All that fuss over that stupid little line and I had the answer in the backyard the whole time. But that's okay. Um, I'm actually quite shocked at how well it fits. But really, if you think about it, it's similar, right? Your, your heater hoses run in the same place as the Titan and the connection's over in a similar place. So it makes sense that it does this, but this literally fits right above these studs just perfectly. And the fact that that mount lines right up over there is just awesome. My only issue now is that it looks like we might have to pull down on that a little bit to get our air box to fit. So let's, uh, let's finish this up, put the air box in and connect everything and we should be able to start it. Well, that was fun while it lasted. It is uh, too close to this, but it's got a lot of space. So uh, I think what I'm gonna do is literally just bend it. So it bends up here. There we go. Yeah, good enough. Hopefully that's you know not gonna give us any lasting issues. But with that, we should be able to now slide this in. All right, come on, baby, get in there. Ooh, okay. Yes, all right, we did it. It's resting against it, but it's aluminum on plastic. I don't really care that much. Huh. Okay, what did I tell you? One small step and then another roadblock. Oh, oh this is getting really old. So <clears throat> this distance has changed, right? So normally the Titan's wider, so uh, even with the Titan air, top, air box top or whatever you want to call it, 
uh, this air box in the Titan, I believe, is further over or something like that. Doesn't matter. Fact of the matter is, I put this here and I have easily three and a half to four inches uh, too much. So I think what I'm going to do is modify this. I'm going to go get those like silicone, the basically cold air intake connectors, and I'm going to cut this off here. And that should give us enough space to line it up and then get a hose from there to there. I think that's going to be the easiest way to do it. And it gets rid of the stupid accordion thing anyway. So, but I'm going to do that tomorrow because it's beer o'clock and dinner time. See you tomorrow. All right. It's the next day. This morning, I ran to all three of my local auto parts dealers in the little town I'm in. And sure enough, they all have three inch and four inch couplers, but not three and a half, which is what the diameter of this is. My patience is fully exhausted with this. I went ahead and just ordered one online, tried to shop locally, but whatever. And now I'm just gonna saw this thing off and I'm going to duct tape it so we can start it. Um, normally I wouldn't worry about just running, you know, running an open intake inside my garage. I'm not that worried about stuff getting in there, but I really wanted to have access to the mass airflow sensor, which is um, in the air box top, as opposed to in the other connection, which, you know, neither here nor there, but let's get that connected, get the battery in here and turn this thing over. Hopefully turn this thing over. All right, so I have it clamped in here and I'm gonna take just a kind of a healthy amount of plastic and I'm gonna push it up till it's on the other side of where I'm cutting. I'm not gonna go crazy on cutting it, but I just wanna make sure I'm not getting shards of plastic up here because from this point beyond, right, is goes straight into the intake. All right, I found this little guy. It's technically for woodworking, but we'll make it work. And I think I can make it reach. So basically I'm just cutting off just the accordion side. So right against it, see if I can wedge it in here. Yeah, okay. And I'm just gonna start sawing it off. You may be wondering why I'm not using power tools here. And that's really just because I'd like a, I'd like a cleaner cut. All right, taking too long. I no longer care if it looks good. All right, I just ran some like heavy gauge sandpaper to take the big pieces off. And then we can take our little plastic guard out <sighs> to sort of blow through there. Um, I was gonna open the windows to kind of air out this molten plastic smell, but, but a bunch of Canadian wildfire smoke just started to fill the room. So you know what, comment down below. What would you rather breathe? Off gassing of molten plastic or Canadian wildfire smoke. First five people to answer, I'll mail you an N95 mask. All right, let's go fit it. Put that in there, twist it down. Okay, it's about an inch and a half away. That's not too bad actually, because you're gonna want a little bit of uh, room for that silicone to flex around and move around, because that was basically the job of the accordion, right? And we couldn't really cut halfway through the accordion because then we wouldn't have a surface to slide the silicone coupler over. So we're actually in pretty good shape here. I'm gonna go ahead and continue to install this. I'm gonna clean this surface off. We'll just duct tape it, and then we'll throw the rest of the intake on. And I'm gonna have to throw my cover back on because it has my oil catch cans on it so I can hook up my PCV. Then we'll throw the battery in and we should be able to start it. Oh yeah, that's not gonna leak at all. Definitely not. All right, this one I'll probably need to get a 90 degree elbow because this is a lot tighter. Again, just another issue with that air box getting moved over. So either way, I'll tighten these down. Oh, I forgot to mention one other thing I did do is I did uh, tie the negative battery cable down to this spot here. This is where the bracket used to be, the uh, battery current sensor, I believe. So I just threw that in there. There's a hole in the line and there's a screw there. So that's what I did. Felt right. All right, let's grab our battery, slide that in. There we go. I think this battery will work. And put the positive on first. Ooh, oh my gosh. Oh, wow. Okay, well, this is way too short. Looks like it's the alternator line. Okay, let's see if we can make it stretch. Oh my God. Oh, all right, all right, we got it on. That is not a permanent solution, probably, but I got it on, so let's do it. All right, let's go see if it powers up. All right, I double checked that I had oil because I didn't remember if I drained it or not. Turns out I didn't. Um, I don't know if you've noticed throughout this video, but I don't have brakes. The lines are currently disconnected, so I'm not even gonna take it off the jack stands. We're just gonna start it see if it runs, see if it even starts, and then, uh, and then that's it. I'm going to get some ear protection because I'm in a steel building and this doesn't have a muffler. The big moment. Okay, so 
I do see the little flashing light with the uh, key in it. So Nats is freaking out. Let's uh, want well, freaking out. It's activated. Put the key in, turn it. Oh, I don't see the Nats thing losing its mind anymore. All right, it's in park. Parking brakes on, doesn't matter. Here we go. Nothing. Huh. Cool. Let's take a look. Before I do anything, I'm going to try a known good battery. This battery, um, I swapped out. Well, first of all, I swapped out for a reason. It's not great. And the voltage uh, that it's showing is uh, not great either on the dash. So I'm just gonna grab one out of my main Xterra. I don't know if Nissan will try to start, if it's low, I don't, I don't know any of that. So let's go grab it, try that first before we do anything else. This one I know, well, I know it works. And fun, fun, I ruined the positive battery terminal on my other Xterra getting this off. So that's really great. All right, swing this on here. All right, let's try it again. It's not that I'm not optimistic, but I'm not gonna bring my earplugs this time. All right, yeah, voltage looks better. Ready? Nothing. Okay, I guess I'll start diagnosing the starter circuit. So I've been racking my brain the last hour or so, and I got all this starter system diagnostic stuff, and most of that's checking out, and except for one, and it looks like it's not sending the signal through the wire to start. So, I got pissed off and I went and had lunch with my husband and I told him about my woes and I said, I can't get the thing to start. It doesn't have brakes and I'm used to driving a manual where you have to have the clutch in to start it. So I said, you don't have to put the brake in to start it, right? And he said, no, but it does have to be in park. And I thought to myself, oh, well we did do the shifter linkage and it did seem really, really tight. So I came back out and instead of putting it in park, I know that vehicles will also start when it's in neutral. So this is what happened when I tried that. It runs. Everything is freaking out, but we'll deal with that. Hey, hey. So it looks like uh, it's either an adjustment on the shift linkage or there's something wrong with the park neutral position switch that tells it that it's in park or some combination of those two. So I'm actually gonna start it back up. I'm gonna make sure that Things are looking okay-ish, and it looks like our power steering fluid already got yanked into the system, so I'm gonna fill that back up, and I'm gonna run it again. All right, I tidied up the electrical box again, put all that back together, make sure my big beautiful thing is all sealed here. Um, checking for any leaks after first startup. Refilled that, let's start it again. I keep stopping it because this keeps pulling this dry, and I really don't wanna Get a bunch of air in there. It's frothy as hell too. Woo! I don't see any big leaks yet. This one in particular I wanted to look at. Yep, that's perfect. That was that injector that sort of spun freely. I don't know if I ever mentioned that, but it had me worried. This thing is real pissed. I'm gonna let this sit a little bit longer. I may have gotten air into the power steering. Can you have that open while it's running? I feel like you can. Let's find out. Oil pressure's good. Rack is real pissed, making noise. Ah, looks good now. Put a little more in. Boy, is it loud. Sounds great. Unfortunately, the dash is uh, doing the old Christmas tree. I'm just gonna let it run for a minute or two. I want it to get a little bit of temperature. Fan's not hitting anything. Going nice and slow. Clutch is still good. Power steering, nothing's hitting that. Not nearly as loud as I thought it was gonna be, so especially when it's just idling. Yeah, I don't know if you can see that. I'm obviously not gonna go down there too tight. Sounds wonderful, honestly. It's just great. Coolant's good. I don't know. I'm. Here we are. Okay, uh, this is freaking fantastic. I'm so, so happy. I would much rather have to deal with the switch down below or the shifter linkage or something like that rather than some obscure issue with the starting circuit. Like I said, the instrument cluster straight up Christmas treed, uh, VDC, slip, airbag, check engine, everything uh, basically went off. So the only problem with that is as far as the VDC and slip at least, I don't know if that was a problem before, right? So it could have been an issue before this ever got this heart transplant. And I doubt Duncan remembers, he drove it like once months ago. So I, I can't expect him to recall that. But theoretically the VDC, the slip and the control or the um, airbag could technically be all messed up due to the spiral cable. So I might just pick one of those up and get an angle sensor and replace those 
because they're easy to replace. And I really want to get this thing through the gears, like actually shift it into different gears. But unfortunately, without brakes, I don't really want to do that. I want to be able to stop the front wheels before, you know, slamming it into park, for instance. So as an experiment, I put the e-brake on and I went from neutral all the way up into the park position. And sure enough, the digital uh, gear readout said it was in reverse. So I put it all the way up and it just said R instead of P. So I'd been texting with Duncan and Brendan. I sent them a video of it starting for the first time, kind of sharing my victory. And uh, I told them about the shifter issue and they both immediately said, oh, it's gotta be the linkage on the transmission. And sure enough, I climb under there and I push the lever as far back as I can, like as far towards the back of the vehicle as I can. And I heard a click and I get back up here and of course the dash shows P. So all I had to do was just readjust that. I loosened it pushed it all the way back and then retightened it and now that's resolved. So super glad that's resolved. That's a nice easy fix. And so was the airbag light. So when I was talking with Brennan, I said, hey, my airbag light's also going off. It might be the spiral cable. And he said, uh, hey, did you plug in your front airbag sensor yet? And of course I looked and I hadn't. So that would be why. Right on the front here, there's a sensor, like a crash sensor or whatever. And uh, that wasn't plugged in yet because I hadn't assembled the whole front end, right? So. Sure enough, I plugged that in. I did the reset, which if you need that, it'll be up in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. And once I did the reset, that went away and that's resolved as well. Check engine light. I just plugged in my OBD reader. I cleared all the codes. It came up with a 603, which seemed like a serious code. It was like a keep alive issue with like the ECM or something. I'm just gonna chalk that up to, you know, everything being disconnected and reconnected and it kind of just temporarily losing its mind because I cleared the code started it a couple more times and it's not coming back. As far as BDC and slip, I'm gonna wait on that until I can actually drive the vehicle and hope that resolves itself, fingers crossed. And the last one was the TPMS light and uh, it's missing two tires right now and I also just don't care about that. So we can forget that one. But that's where we're gonna end today's video. Um, what a huge step forward, right? We're just about there. Off camera, I'm going to resolve the brakes. That wasn't really part of this job. Uh, the exhaust, that's probably gonna be a separate video, uh, maybe next week. Again, fingers crossed if I can get all my stuff together. And then off camera, I'm also gonna reassemble the front end. That really is just reversing all the steps that you did to take them off. So I'm not gonna waste your time having you watch all of that. But this is huge. Hopefully by next week, we'll be able to test drive this. We will at least be able to drive it in the yard. I still need to register it with the state of Michigan, but I'm super excited that this is wrapping up and we can move on to other fun stuff. If you like this video, please scroll down, click like, and also hit that subscribe button to keep up with not only this project, but everything else we have going on. Please support the brands that support me. If you check down in the description, you're gonna see links to Nissan Parts, Polar, Driven Desire, and Off-Road Gorilla. And if this video helped you a whole ton, maybe saved you some time or money, you can say thanks by buying me a beer. Just scroll down, click that super thanks button. Have a great week, guys. I'm gonna go start this thing up again and just sit here and watch it run for a little while.